back in the States, I think. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. And, Hello. Um, welcome to the first ever Manyata Talks. Um, I am joined by very wonderful people to talk about how to market your short film, which um, we sometimes think is, um, well, some people I think take for granted what it, what it, what it would be like to, to market your film and some people have no clue. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and then halfway through, we'll start to read them out and get them answered as best as we can. So we are joined by some very lovely people. I'll ask them to introduce themselves, please. Hi, we'll start I'm with Majuro. Hey everyone, I'm Wanjiro Njandu. I'm a filmmaker based in Los Angeles. Director, writer, reluctant producer. And we'll talk about that. Hello everyone, my name is Samora Kibagendi. I'm a filmmaker. I'm based in Kisi, Kenya. And for people like Sam who are uh, not in Kenya, you might not know where it is, but it's a small town very far away from Nairobi. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to be here and I love short films, I love short form content and I'm looking forward to this engagement. Nice. Um, hi, my name is Sam Tebandeke, I'm Ugandan and I happen to be in Kenya uh, at this very moment. But, you know, I'm a filmmaker, uh, producer, writer, director and since a few months ago I set up a streaming channel. It's nice yeah, to and I be want here. to know why it is that you decided to do that. We'll talk about that. In the meantime, Denise? My name is Denise. I work with Showmax, which is a video on demand platform. I am a content buyer, come curator, come whatever people need me to do as far as this job is concerned. And I'm excited to be here. So great. So, what I would like us to kick off with is everyone's story. Um, why they decided to make film, why they decided to make shorts, and what everyone's experience has been with getting their films out there, what gems you have to share, and what questions you might have, and how you answered those questions. Shall we start with Winjiro? Um, yeah. Um, so I, I love, I look at short films like just a way to tell a really good story in a short amount of time, but even more so, they I, I, I feel they, have, they serve a really big importance in calling cards for directors. You know, the bigger a project, whether it's a film or a feature, you know, more voices are added in. You have to deal with funders. You have to deal with people down the line who are buying the project. So a short film really lets you as a filmmaker express your voice. And it's a, it's a fun space to play in. You know, you can come up with the craziest idea. And because it's such a short amount of time commitment, especially for crews, you can get really great crews to say yes you know, depending on what you're looking to shoot. So for me, I look at them as just a way to not only tell great stories and tell great stories very concisely and in a small amount of time, but also for them to be a calling card as a director so that you can do different different projects. You know, you can do a sci-fi, you can do a drama, you can do a comedy, and that way you have a body of work that showcases, you know, your unique voice as, as a director, but in the different genres. Nice. So what was your, what was your short? Um, but I have one that was just acquired. It starts a festival circuit in October, but the one before that was Box. So Box is the story of Henry Box Brown. He was an enslaved man who actually mailed himself to freedom. This man put himself in a crate and mailed himself over the Mason-Dixon line from the south to the north. And so with that film, I knew I wanted it to be a very technical piece, but it was also just one actor on screen. And so I had to think about... I wanted to humanize his story and how could I do that? So we shot everything inside the box and my DP, the minute I sent him, I, I, you know, I sent him a script that he's like, hold up. Like we're seeing nothing else. And he's like, yeah. Oh, he's like, I mean, you know, and from that point, it was just like dominoes falling everyone. And so, you know, box really handled the humanity and the cruelty of the time because I feel people always go, Oh, not another slave movie. You never right. hear that about the Holocaust. Like why are we not right. to express our stories? or not another story about an African genocide or an African refugee. Like I was, I thought of myself, how could I tell this story, but put, make it in such a human way that you either felt you were him or you were the reason what was happening to him and the accountability. Right, okay. 
So then you decided to make the film and how many festivals? I, I forget. I forget how many festivals. I mean, there's so many. Let's hear it. <laughs> like we've had schools, schools at events. Um, official selections, we are about, we are, we're heading towards 70. And the film, and it's funny because I thought in quarantine that it would, it would have slowed down, but now people are actually home that festivals have a much bigger audience. I'm even going to more festivals because they're online. They don't have to dress up. I don't have to drive to the theater. So, but that being said, the festival circuit is a full-time job. Like if I show you my festival Excel sheet, bridge sheet, and you know, the film, I tell people for every festival you submit to, for every four, expect to be rejected from two or three. It's, it's just like people get overwhelmed. It doesn't, it doesn't fit the programming. So it's, it's never personal. You know, I try and, and look at that. And the really big festivals, God bless them. They say they look at everything. I don't believe so because I had a festival program director, see box at another event and I was like, oh my God, you should submit to my festival. I said, I did. You all rejected it, you know? Right. And, and then there's that awkward moment, but you know, you, you, you keep the person in the space. So yeah, it's, it's been a long festival run, uh, keeping the presence of the film online, uh, Facebook, Twitter, social media, um, doing the promotions through Film Freeway. You know, once in a while you boost the film so that, you know, more programmers see it and request the film or send your festival waiver. So it's, it's a full-time job. Right. And why did you decide to go the film festival route? Um, it's just, I wanted the story to get out. You know, the thing is, Box with every every meeting, every every person I send in the industry to film, I get that meeting. So I already knew the film was doing that. But it was also just to bring awareness of his story. I mean, you always want to do a festival run, but there's certain things also festivals do for you as a filmmaker. Um, like this year, I became an Academy member uh, through the Short Films branch. You have to have certain qualifications. Thank you. I'm like, thank you. Now open the door. The rest of us come in. You know, um, just wedge your foot in there. Don't ever let it close. Yes. Also and Nicole Kidman did it for the Australians, so we're going to hold the door open. Yeah. But, you know, there are certain things, you know, like if you're sub direct, submitting for TV directing programs, there are certain festivals that they want to see your film has played in. So mm -hmm. there, there are certain additional benefits that come with the film festival circuit. There are meetings, like the reason I got nominated was some a festival uh, program director sent box to an Academy member who made me his nominee, you know? And a total stranger saw the film, fell in love, and was like, oh, you meet all the uh, you know, nominee criteria, so you're going to be my nominee. It's, it's a nomination process. So it's, it's a way of also getting your voice out as a filmmaker, you know, getting familiar, audience building. I, I feel that you know, people don't talk about audience building, that I have people who watched one of my first shots way back in the day who still send me a message being like, oh, I just saw this project like 11 years later. You know? So you build in that, that committed audience that, that will always come back and see your work and, and, and share your work. Okay. Um, Samara, I know that you were interested in getting your work out there, but you took a completely different route. I want to hear about that. I love short films. I, I do, and I respect them a lot. And as a producer, I fear making short films because I know that you can't get it wrong because with a, with a short film, uh, it takes a lot of work for you to compress everything to into that short format in a way that will leave an impression and in a way that will stick. And But I love short films a lot. And um, But I didn't quite figure out how they are distributed and how they are monetized. That became a big challenge. I, I have been interested in producing short films, but and I've produced short films with some friends before. But we had a big challenge in distributing them. So I stayed away from them because... As I have a friend called Albert Nyakundi, uh, he's a filmmaker, and he likes to say that sometimes a short film could even cost you as much as a feature film. So uh, why would you want to invest? So he always asks us, why would you want to invest in a short film when you can just use the same cast and just make a feature out of it? But then I know that there's a space for short films. There's an audience for it. There's, um, it's an art of its own kind that's very different from, from features. And we need to figure out the distribution. And I think that's why I'm very interested in this conversation because I really want, uh, would like, like to hear what everyone else is doing and how it's working out for them. And, um, but as you mentioned, I took a different route. When I couldn't figure that out, I was like, okay. One of the things, the challenges that, I, I, that we met is that um, 
we don't have that culture of watching short form content. Most people who go to cinemas, they want to watch a full feature. They want to, when they want to pay that, uh, whether it's uh, $5 or $7, they want it to count. They want to be there for two hours or even three hours if possible. So, but, um, so I, I, I felt that we need to create a culture of people appreciating short form content and being okay that it can be that short and be that good and not complain. Oh, why was it only seven minutes? Why was it only 15 minutes? So I focused more on building an audience for my content in general, not just for the short, for short form, because I'm a producer, I produce anything that I know will be appreciated by people out there. So I focused more on, first of all, building an audience and uh, being part of a platform where people can watch this content. Because again, even, get, even when you have a very good short film and you have an audience out there that is willing to watch your short film, sometimes it's not very easy for you to get that content to them. And, and that's why may, uh, platforms like Magneta screen, uh, Screening is very important and uh, should be very should be very much protected and encouraged. And, and yeah, so me, I focused more on creating an audience. Sorry, I said I appreciate the plug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I took um, a, a not very popular route. I moved away from Nairobi because we realized that uh, people in the capital have too many options. They already have too many options of uh, what they can watch, where, when they can watch it, and they are used to viewing what they need on demand. So if you only have one short film in a year or two, they wouldn't care much about you. So I decided to build my audience from where I come from, from the Western region, and uh, make them appreciate what we do, and also channel them now to, to my platform. And that's what I've been doing with uh, DZTV and not making short films exactly, but making short form content and making them appreciate that as, uh, because short form content is, it's cheaper to make for me, I feel, because with features, again, uh, most times uh, features are very expensive to produce. Uh, so I use the little funds that I'm able to make to make short form content, but more importantly, use the short form content to build an audience and create a culture that appreciates local Kenyan content. Um, yeah, and uh, hopefully the we can be able to monetize that. So Sam, would you say that you felt like that too? Because I know that Kiasi TV is newly minted. How young is it? Um, let me see, April, five months. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's five so months why now. did you decide to do that? Because you were on the other end before. Um, well, it was, uh, it was like some more I was frustrated. Um, I made a film. I thought the festivals would take it, and um, they didn't. Well, a couple of them took it, and for a couple of uh, months, actually a couple of years, I was a bit frustrated that no one was taking that content. So I thought, instead of putting it on uh, YouTube or Vimeo, why not put? Why not set up something for people like me who do not have options for their short form content to be exhibited and seen by audiences? and you know take it from there and see if we can monetize it but at the very least showcase it because like you, we all know short form content has it's a wonderful space for upcoming filmmakers but also also even established filmmakers can can get a chance to experiment and and try new forms of storytelling so i, I thought it was a nice space to create that's why okay. i set it up okay um, yeah. I know that before, prior to this, uh, you were doing a whole bunch of other work, which um, which I'm very interested in. I mean, that's how we met. Um, do you want mm. to talk a little bit about that? Because you were making films, but then also you are the person to come to if you have this baby in your hand going, okay, it needs to go somewhere. Why are people not running to me to grab to grab an opportunity and screening my precious baby? Yeah, so I, I'm a producer. Well, it was more a case of producer by, what's the word? By fire. Thank you. <laughs> it's almost like you have no choice. I don't want to say you have no choice, but it's almost like, I, I just love to produce things, honestly. It, it's, I really do. And one of the things that I realized as well is that, okay, so I have a film I've made. Where can I take it? So I started to do research on uh, different platforms, different festivals, and I started to compile a list of them 
uh, deadlines, fees, websites, any other information that people would need, if it's an ESCA qualifying festival or not, because that was interesting to me. Um, you know, things like that. So that's kind of the, that's, you know, where I was yeah. when, when, you know, and I also used to work for One Fine Day, so I got an insight into festivals and sort of like the mechanics of things and what stuff you need to submit and how to prepare and how to plan for all that. So it was a wonderful opportunity to do that. Yeah, so I'm really interested in how to plan for all of that because literally anyone can apply to a festival, but what's the rigor of that? What's the due diligence of that? And what do you do when you don't have some of the things that you need? That's one of the things I really want you to talk about, Sam. So we'll get back to you. But Denise, tell us about Showman and shorts. Um, and gosh, I think after, I'm a wild card in this situation. You know, what, what are you after? Because shorts, okay. I mean, I was really surprised to find out that um, VOD platforms are in fact interested in programming shorts, but there's certain criteria that they need to yeah, yeah. that they need to fulfill, and there's um, mm -hmm. and there's there's a way yeah. there's a way that they need to be presented. So again, if Howa comes to okay. Denise going, Denise, look at my fabulous baby, program it, and you go, yes, I like it, or maybe no, I don't like it. But if you say yes, I like it, but I also need, brrr, and I go, what do you mean? What do you mean you need these things? Here's the baby. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, I I guess let me speak maybe as someone who's had a background in working for a couple of broadcasters in Kenya and say I think one of the areas where we have sort of um I don't know if the word to say is failed or lacked um initiative is where scheduling of shorts is concerned. Um, merely by their duration, I think there's a bit of angst around them from a scheduling perspective, because if you're, let's say, the content buyer and you have a team who reports to you and they do um, the schedules and then you give them one shot and it's 15 minutes and the slot is 24 minutes, there's a bit of angst around that kind of scheduling. Um, there's a bit of angst around what kind of advertising revenue would come out of even a short just being pitched. Um, it's there's a lot of thought that goes into it, and I think that's why it's a legacy issue that people have been adverse to shorts. But I think one of the interesting things is something that Samora brought up in the debriefing session that we had prior around maybe the issue is that we never looked for thematic ways of scheduling, right? right. Maybe we never said that we're looking for drama. We never said we're looking for sci-fi. Like, we didn't try and solve what the inherent issue is. So I think... From that perspective, I can say that's why I think um, maybe pay TV and um, free-to-air stations sort of would steer clear. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, it still does an amount to some extent in just not supporting the scene as much mm -hmm. as length movies or series do get um, airtime. So it's, it's, it's tricky grounds as far as that's concerned. Um, to answer what do we look for, honestly... So before you get into that, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Denise, but before you get into that, it's important to note that you are interested in finding a way to program shorts now. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. So my 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 benefit in in the video on demand space is that we're not bound to scheduling restrictions like a station would be. From a timing perspective, from appointment viewing perspective, we don't have those restrictions. Um it's, it's important to just state that because I can't speak for other broadcasters and any other issues that they would want to take at this point. Um, but I still think it's a challenge to us to improve that aspect of scheduling content. Um, because a lot of people have, I think you, you called them proof of concept last time. And they're still exciting. There's so many things that I've seen. I mean, even there's a point where big ideas were doing shorts just to experiment with a lot of vibes. And I think or brilliant, right? Um, and I feel shorts play in that space where a lot of people complain that traditional TV has become a bit monotonous in terms of the stories that they tell. So mm -hmm. definitely something special as far as shorts are concerned. And I think also like what Samora is doing is pretty brilliant because he's tapping into cultural nuances that might not 
be easily export- exportable amongst communities. And he's hitting a niche as far as that's concerned, which is fantastic. Um, so it's, it's, it's tough, it's tough, but I, yeah. let me for what, for video on demand and what I think the opportunities are there and what we would be looking for. Of course, mm-hmm. production value has to be pretty, pretty amazing. Um, mm-hmm. A unique story, like it's, it's, it's not rocket science to say a great shot. It's really not. For me, the question is what support content do you have for the meta, um, for the short? A lot of times you don't get metadata. Someone sends a short, they send a link on Google Drive, they're like, have. So you're like, uh, what's the year of production? Who is the cast? What is the synopsis? From whence have you come? Like, what's the deal? You know. Um, Denise, Denise, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Just for the cheap seats, um, metadata, what is that? Yeah. Metadata is just basically, oh, Sam has gone off. He lost power. Sorry about that. Oh no, Sam. Okay, we'll we'll try and get you back as soon as possible. Okay. But I'm, 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 I'm still here. I'm still here. Oh good. Okay. Oh sweet. Oh good. Sweet. Cool. Metadata is basically just what I described, um, but it it will vary depending on the people that you work with, the particular supplier. So for me, when when you come to me, give me your year of production, give me your cast, give me your synopsis. I want to know who the director is. I want to know who the producer is. Um, now, to the, to, the, to the the one I'm emotional about, poster art. Um, <laughs> guys, guys, thumbnails. Thumbnails are not... Um, I, I appreciate that um, people have different financial situations when they are creating shorts but you really do need to figure out what you want that visual to be to represent your short. So let's say you get a deal with Showmax, you get a deal with Netflix, you get a deal with Amazon, and then your poster is some guy holding his phone like, please don't let that be your portion as what represents your content. Um, and I think it's just important to, to if you, if to just think through it, see what kind of cre- um, relationships you have with creatives to be able just to come up with something pretty decent. It can be things around experimenting even with the font that, of how you call your title. If it's called power, does it have some oomph? Like just, just give some reference as far as the poster art is concerned, because this is what is going to be, sorry to borrow Anjiro's term, Anjiro. your, for your, for your <laughs> content. Just raise my hand. Um, yeah, Denise, I want to piggyback on your point because, yeah. um, you know, people, I, 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 I was very fortunate to work for four and a half years in universal marketing. But even before that, one of the things it drives my set photographer mad or whoever is taking pictures of my set, I always have my own camera on set. So in between setups or anything, I'm always snapping pictures. And I'll give an example. The first, um, I know the, 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 the publicist behind the, the first half of the Fast and Furious franchise. The first picture, the first poster you remember was Vin Diesel and Paul Walker on the car from the top. Nobody was taking that picture. She asked for a ladder, asked one of the grips, get me a ladder, went up there with the set photographer, was like, this is what I want you to take, take this picture. And so I tell people, you're, you think about your still, your main image, because when I go on set, I think about one take of how it would be so iconic that once we color correct, and another thing people, you can pull your stills from your color corrected films. They will really help you because they'll be color graded, look beautiful. I think of the one image and my DPs know there's there's some shots I don't compromise on. I'm like, I don't know how you're going to do it, but do it. And a lot of times that one thought I have in my head, if I go with the intent of shooting it, I grab a still for that and that becomes my poster image. So always directors always have a camera. You will have an opportunity to shoot something that you're not expected. You know, it, it can come organically, it can come planned, but always have your set, even if it's your phone, if you have like a small cannon somewhere, I'm always on set, like I'm always snapping people. And you also get really good behind the scenes stuff because you get crews in these moments or even actors in a moment, you know, just by themselves. And because your eye, your eye is constantly working and you have to train it to constantly see that. But the one thing I tell filmmakers, and it's, it's a, and it's not just, you know, somebody with the phone, like, you know, I've gotten that when I do festival consultations here, I look at someone, I'm like, why did you use this image? And 
And then you have somebody, and, and the thing is, if you're not proficient in Photoshop, take time to teach yourself. Like there are tutorials, you, you see a picture that has edges. If I can see your edges on, on an edited content, you take me out of it, no matter how beautiful the image is. And it's, as a filmmaker, a lot of the stuff you create will be yourself. I, I didn't start by knowing Photoshop, I taught myself. And, and, and it's actually a really fun skill to have to be able to, const even if I'm not working on a film, I'm always like, I take an image, I manipulate it and everything. And, it's, and it grows your muscle as a director when you do that. So then, okay, so to fun piggyback fun. on your piggyback. Oh, the, exactly. To piggyback on the piggyback and then tomorrow we're coming to you. <laughs> okay. It sounds like anyone who is not thinking about everything from the beginning, how it is that you're going to position your film is being negligent. So we, can, we do not have the luxury of hoping to figure out how to market or what images you want after the fact. You can't fix it in post, no. <laughs> no, this is not one of the things you can fix in post. Okay. So I, think, I think there are certain steps, as, and, and Sam, sorry to, to, to jump in. There are certain steps you can take as a filmmaker. You know, make an Instagram, that's free. Make a Facebook account, make, you know, sharing content, making people interested. Instead of just dropping everything on one day, you know, we're not Chris Nolan. We don't have that luxury of having that anticipation. But if people see, oh, okay, she's already putting in the work or he's already putting in the work. But there are certain things, you know, you can, if you post an Instagram image, if it's not very engaging, you ask yourself, okay, is this image not working? Or if you post something and then everyone likes it, you're like, okay, visually, this is pulling my audience's eye. You know, and that, so there's simple free ways, I call it, of test screening, but, you know, setting up your Facebook, your Twitter, your Instagram, even a Wix website, it would be, it would have Wix in it, but it would be free to host your film, um, that type of thing. Sorry, Sam. <laughs> it's okay. I wanted to say something that uh, you might, I'm not sure if uh, Denise can remember this, but four years ago, I tried to sell a movie to her uh, for Showmax, and uh, she didn't like my poster. And she said that we can't proceed if we don't have a good poster. This cannot sell. And she had so many things to say about my fonts and na 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 na. And I didn't like her for that. I was like, this is my creative um, expression. I mean, just take it. It's what we have. I have a movie behind it. It took me a lot of time and money to make. Why? Why is she giving me a hard time? And then she she had all this list of questions. Can I get this? Can I get uh, behind the scenes photos? Can I get all this information about the directors and the actors? And I realized that I had none of that. Because when we went into the making of the movie, the only thing that we had was a script. And we knew that we had uh, friends for actors that we could call, call on. Yeah. And we went and made the yeah. movie and we liked it. We edited it ourselves and we were like, this is good, this can actually sell. And then now we started to sell and then we realized, okay, the people we, want, we intend to sell to, they're asking too many questions that we are not prepared for. I got so frustrated until I cut that communication with Denise because I realized I'm not trying to get these people again because some of the actors, we didn't even know their second names, sorry to say. Because we're like, okay, we, we called them, they came, we, they did their part and they left. So uh, again, to calling them, and I think something that we talked about during the deep debrief, that these actors have already moved on to another project. So the, um, it's, it was very hard for us to bring them and tell them, oh, we need this and that. Uh, we didn't take in our photos. We didn't have a poster. So could we do this and that? And then we realized that um, we were not uh, uh, <laughs> prepared for that. So I think, and then since that was a lesson that I'll never forget. So, and anytime uh, when I want to go into a project that I care about, I'll get, if I don't have the money for it and I can't beg someone enough to come to, to the set to do my photography, I'll get an intern. And uh, something that I've really come to learn over time is that there are people who are always willing to help if you ask. So if, if you put it out there that you're into onto this project, you, you, you think it's going to be an amazing project, there'll be someone who will be like, oh, I'm free that week. Can I come and do your, your photography? Or you just tell them, I need a photographer on my set. And it makes mm -hmm. a big difference when you get into the marketing Especially now, now that I know this better, that um, I'll have my my Facebook page for the for the uh, for the project or my my Instagram. You need at least a couple of images to throw up there every day, and then if you didn't prepare for that, then your marketing will only last a week, because then you, all your content you'll you'll start to reuse your content. And then something again that was mentioned during the debrief that even even on Netflix. Like they will even change their their posters, the the thumbnails on their content. Like every couple of days, they will change that, and you you'll think it's a new project. If you've not watched it, you'll be like, oh, 
oh, so this woman is in this film. I, I liked her other film. And she was not even in there. She's not in, on the main poster. But then you'd watch the movie because of that. So I think this is very important for filmmakers to understand the be prepared for distribution before you go on set. Before you shoot your very first shot, know that how am I going to sell this? That's very a very important conversation to have. And filmmakers in Kenya especially have been very uh, shy from getting into that conversation. They don't want to understand the, log- the, um, the nitty gritties of distribution. And then we end up hating on the distributors and content buyers, but then we didn't prepare for that conversation. So but it's a question I- of... Sorry. Go ahead, I, know, I know, constantly jumping in. But so what I understand, so Denise, in the interest of making sure, well, you know, we'll do our two bob in making sure that you don't keep getting, you know, projects that don't have the metadata. Could you provide a list? And then we yeah. could stick it at the bottom of this so that at the bottom of this, once we put it up, so that people have a yeah. reference to know what it is. Because I think if people have that, they can start thinking about it. Yeah. Because it is, because um, Samora, you're right. It is very hard once you've asked for all the favors under the sun with your script to, to get it made to then go back and ask someone, actually, could you please, please do this interview? Because, you know, marketing for the film. And it's like, what do you mean, marketing for the project? I've cut my hair. I'm going to Kisumu. I'm out of here. What else do you want? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, we had a rap party. Yeah, the downtime in set <laughs> yeah. all time on set. You know, you sit, you, you you put a camera on a stand, just start talking to your actors or start talking to your grip and you get all this beautiful, and even before, you know, take pictures of a rehearsal, take pictures of, you know, wardrobe preparations, all those things count. And, and to add to Sam and Denise's point, think about how when you see a poster of a movie, you're like, hey, I'm going to see that. Hey, I'm going to, you know, have you ever watched a, a movie, seen a poster and a trailer, and then you watch the movie and you're like, I was fooled into watching this. It's not a great movie. And hey. the images are so amazing. <laughs> like, I will, I, will, I will share a deep, dark secret. I always watch the Sharknado films. They just, I'm just like, let me just see what the poster will look like, and they're going to suck me in. And it's just so over the top and so fun. But yeah. it's that image, like, you know, when you're going to see Avengers, you're, you know, there's a, there's, there's a franchise, but there's the image as well. You're like, oh, Thor's helmet has changed. This has changed. So just think about, it's like shopping. Like there's a website in the US called wish.com. Goodness, if you, the way the pictures are and what you get are two different things, but they're so well presented. I learned my lesson. You know, it's like online shopping. Or if you're looking to buy something, the image you look at, you know, will influence your decision as a consumer. And that's, that's your audience. It's a consumer. But Denise right. touched on something, and I'm, I, I think we really need to speak on it. The runtime of short films, the 16 minute shorts in the 24 minute slot. Like, like, can we talk on that? Because I've been programming for the last two years, and short films, when they run long, they're even more painful than feature films. Like, <laughs> I just, I, I honestly, I, I think I had some filmmakers' feelings when I tell them, can you short be under 10 minutes, please? Okay, so there's a couple of things here. We will come back, Bonjiro. Okay. I see the look on your face. We're coming. Okay. We will circle back. Okay. Before we do that, though, I mean, yes, the thing about the short, the novella, that is, in fact, the 20-minute section, you know, where people are meandering between the short and, you know, and uh, a super short feature yeah. is something to be addressed. Um, but... The other thing that we slightly touched on that we haven't quite gotten, which I would like for us to really address, is the importance of getting your cast on board to promote your film. Because the marketing of your film, if you have great images, is wonderful, but it goes further if your cast is on board. I just want to talk about that a little bit. Because um, I know, you know, when I was saying, yeah, but we're done. I mean, Kisumu, that may or may not be actual something that happened, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I know people run into that a lot because it's not something you generally think about. Because when, when you start your film, you've got your script, prayers, and lots of good wishes from people who are there to support you. But because you're not thinking about what comes after because you're just so happy to make it to that end 
that you find yourself on the back foot then with the goodwill of your caste because you didn't ask for them to give interviews or whatever it is. So how to handle that? And does this then mean that you have to talk to journalists or bloggers or wherever it is that you could get um, material made or noise made about your project? So I'll, I'll, I'll partly step into that um, and say, so one of the things that we've been lucky to have for us guys as Showmax is we have a content marketing department. So let's say for all intents and purposes, maybe Samora is able to deliver the poster and, and the metadata. We're still in a position to even send like um, one of our teammates to maybe do written interviews where we share um, interviews with blogs, um, local newspapers, to be able to just create a bit more awareness about what the product is. Because my biggest concern generally is people look at a sale as the end of the whole process. So you've gotten onto a platform, what then, right? And I think these things that Samora and Wanjira are touching about are just basically things that give a lifespan to the content that you're giving aside from giving credibility to it. Um, my proposal also when you're doing the sale is to any, any platform is ask what value are you getting out of the deal in terms of marketing? Because fine, maybe you haven't come out with the best content possible, but a lot of these, um, these, these stations probably have um, slots where you can maybe learn a couple of trailers. Like there's different opportunities depending on who you're with. Are you going to have a chance to maybe have like a prime slot, like maybe the first billboard on the platform? Do they have a paper? Are you able to get like a small slot? Just, just ask what opportunities you can get from a broadcaster because the bigger issues is that people don't ask. And the buyer will never be the one to tell you, oh, I have a free slot here. Like it's, it, it's not always guaranteed to be honest. Um, so my proposal is when you're selling, just ask what opportunities there are for further promotion so that it just doesn't sit on the platform. Good point. Um, this is where I'm gonna ask Sam, the master hustler of figuring out what to do when you need stuff, all the stuff that we've just mentioned, your metadata and you don't have it. What what would you do? What what can you do? Which Sam? Did the Sam get no, we have two Sam. So <laughs> Sam, Sam, and he's just smiling at me. He <laughs> cannot hear me. Oh, he can't. Sam, can you hear us? Yeah. Oh. The question was um, I don't think you heard my question. I was asking. Well, I'll, I'll just go <clears throat> this one. <laughs> I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. I, I did. I did. Good. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just talk about my experience. Um, so I made the film. And so I go to these websites uh, and I decide to look through what, what, what are the options. So I look at Film Freeway, I look at Without a Box. Without a Box has since closed. And so I look at all the festivals out there and a lot of them have similar requirements. You know, you, all the stuff that you guys have talked about. So what I did is basically talk to my editor, I mean, and start to look at what are the different options of film stills that we can look at, um, I went to canva.com and I made a poster myself. I've never made a poster, please note. Um, so canva.com is amazing. They have templates. So don't let that be an excuse for you not to make a poster. Um, then I started to compile that data myself, like really, because it's my film. I'm the producer and I know everything about it. So kind of put together your synopsis, your press kit, which involves all that stuff really and start to think about, okay, so you have all this stuff ready, now where are you taking it, you know? So there's also, it's, there's also some sort of strategy around it because there's, there's getting all the stuff, but also figuring out when are you going to submit to what festival? Because if I have a film now, that means Khan is possibly out of the question because the deadline's gone and the festival's gone. But when is the next opportunity? And sometimes some festivals want to be the first ones that show your film. You know, they want a world premiere or an international premiere. 
or you know all the all the logistics the politics around that you have to i had to learn by myself I, and it's, it's like basically research that you have to do and it is it is unfortunate that there's no one to tell you that before you make the film and i'm glad that you've opened up this space how and manyata screenings for us to be able to tell tell people this you have to do this planning beforehand like you have the script and you want to shoot the film you need to make that decision at that stage you know what is the plan make the plan you know no one teaches you strategy in this industry you have to make your own plan you have to figure out what is the story i'm trying to tell and then figure out where is it where am i going to plug it in terms of festivals because i'm not going to take my my drama to a horror festival obviously neither am i going to take it to a kids festival you know so you have to be very clear about that a lot of people what they do is that oh i have my film i'll just submit to 5000 festivals and then and you're like look think about it what what's, what value is being added to you from that festival you know <laughs> i've taken my film to say durban oh that's a fantastic festival because i know it's focused on african film you know if i take it to khan and you know i can brag about that and say look my film went to khan you know that's that's something you can use for the next film so it's not just about getting a festival laurel it's about what festival laurel are you getting sorry i may have gone beyond the question you asked anyway but <laughs> no kind of it's, it's about not, it. actually no cuz you you touched on something really important it's it's not just about getting into a festival is it the right festival for your film and once you're in that festival yeah. how do you position your film because even if you do get into can yeah. yes you do have bragging rights about can but what will can do for your film in the long run that yeah. it has a life yeah if you go to can but then yes. it is literally at the bottom of the pile yeah. everywhere and people are running to the short that Wong Kar Wai made or that Quentin Tarantino has just dropped then you're nowhere yes you're at can with your short yeah. but no one saw it whereas if you go to yeah. a smaller festival wh- whose focus is fairly slightly different then your film might have a bigger platform because it's not so massive a pond how how um sorry can i just add on to oh, what this is something else oh sorry okay um I'm going you to know, go Denise ahead, go ahead. Go. I'm going to Denise go and then Sam. No, I I just want to echo what Sam is saying in terms of when you're doing your research and you're speaking to multiple parties. So what tends to happen for us guys sometimes as the buyers is the creators are treading that space between do we do broadcast, do we do festival and it's you you end up having conversations for the sake of longevity for nothing because this person is not sure about what journey they want their content to take right so you come to me and you're asking for $10,000 one day and then you go silent because another festival is like yeah bring 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 your short so long as it hasn't premiered anywhere and then you mess up a relationship because you weren't really sure i think it's just important to always be clear about what journey you have because I don't think there's any particular issue for example with you debuting at a festival and telling me hey I've gotten this opportunity I think it's fantastic for my film this is the journey I want to take for it can I come back to you later and what will the likelihood of the offer being present still be right um I I especially my bigger concern is sometimes you can do the festival circuit for maybe a year or two and then you put your sh- your 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 film on the shelf yet there's some there's a place that you can actually take it to so i think it's just important to figure out after you do the festival circuit what's the journey afterwards and where can you take it sorry sir you triggered me <laughs> no 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 completely uh no um so for me it's um you mentioned something very important i wanted to go back to what howers was talking about like when your film is at the festival and it's at the bottom of the pile um there is also something else about marketing the film at the festival Okay so it's it, just, it doesn't end like you have to constantly talk about your project constantly 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 and then I like what you said Denise because a lot of the time we as creators we're not very good at communicating 
All we do is create the thing and then we forget that, look, there are relationships that need to be maintained. And even if I don't get my film on Showmax today, I need to maintain that relationship. It's almost like uh, with investors in like, companies, they know each other. Same as festivals, same as broadcasters, distributors. It's a small world, just like the film community is. You must maintain a good relationship. I, I used to work for a management consultancy, and what they used to t when I before I left, my boss used to, my boss used to say something that, bef like when you leave a place, leave with a good relationship because you never know when you will need to come back. If you do, you get don't burn the bridges unless it's completely out of your out of your power or if it's compromising your values. Yeah. Until then, you <laughs> must maintain relationships. They're so important because I'm not just making short films. Uh, I'm going to make, like the film I made, the short film, I'm going to make a feature out of it, okay? So there is that, like, that journey as well that I need to think about. And if I've messed up people, the relationship with other people before, then it's not going to work. Same thing with the marketing at the festivals. Talk to the programmers, write to them. I, had, I got... I got twice uh, waivers for on the submission fees to Toronto International Film Festival because I wrote an email and, and told them, look guys, I don't have money, but I'd really like to submit my film, you know? And I think it was Phoebe who kind of first gave us that contact, um, Phoebe Kioria. And then from that, that was the first time. So the next time I went back, I already knew them and the person had moved on, but she said, look, Talk to this person because that they're now in my position. Are you seeing that? Twice. This is the one of the biggest festivals in the world. And I got a waiver. Okay, we didn't get in both times. But see, that's the thing. Like, people want to know that there is a, a human at the other end of the line who's pass personable, who's who's um, kind, who's generous, who's all the wonderful things. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Banjiro, please. Sam, Sam beat me to it, other Sam, so. <laughs> okay, I really wanted to, to add on what uh, Sam Tebande K is saying of, about uh, relationships because it's my, it's my very important consideration and it's my suggestion on in the, about uh, this scenario where we are in with what we're trying to figure out. It's very important to have good relationships, not just at the distribution level, but especially beginning even right from uh, the production process with your actors, with your crew. It's a very, it's very important to have very strong relationships because um, first, I really uh, believe that the best way to make shorts make you money is to think of them as a short film series or have many of them in mind rather than just making one short film and expecting to make money from it. If you don't have um, that consistency that you let people know that you make short films, and let them trust that you make good short films. So that if you go to Denise and tell her, I have a new short film, she already knows that you make good short films. So it will be an easy conversation and it will, be, it will help you to build that relationship with her because she knows that you make, you make uh, short films. And then for you to make uh, many short films, because short films cost money, a lot of money. But uh, as I suggested uh, during the debrief that if you thought of 10 short films when you're getting started, that I'm going to make 10 short films in the next two years or three years, then it's easy for you to build a relationship even with your crew. And then when you have a good relationship with your crew, then it's easy for you to share your vision with them. It's easy for you to uh, polish your vision and your strategies and your, your, your skills. And then you're able to put that into the next film so that you learn from, from your past experiences. And then I, I believe that that will help you to make better short films as time goes by, instead of you having a new crew every time. And, and I know some, some of the best directors in the world had known to have one DOP that they work with all the time, mostly because that relationship is very important uh, when you want to. Uh, you add on to each other's skills as time goes by. So I really want to encourage filmmakers out there, learn the art of making, uh, of creating good relationships, both with your cast, with your crew, with the distributors, with the bloggers, with anyone who can add value to your short film. Because when you have that relationship, sometimes a relationship from three years ago, from five years ago, will help you to make to sell your next short film. Because someone will remember, oh, we did an interview with you last time. Um, our, our viewers or our audience would like to know, what are you working on now? Where have you been for the last five years? But if you, if, if you if, let's say someone gives you an interview, 
And after that interview, then maybe you don't show gratitude or they, they feel that you didn't appreciate what they did, then it will be hard for them to give you an interview the next time. But if someone gives you an interview and then maybe you follow up and you thank them and then you even you even tell them, oh, the, 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 inter the short film that you interviewed me for is now on this platform, then they can say, oh, now why can't you come back and we do a follow up or of sorts? Or can you also talk to my friend who has this other platform that he can also maybe give you some more exposure or something like that? So relationships, relationships, that's it will solve very many of our, of our problems right now. Agreed, agreed. Um, Wanjiro, I know you want to say something. I just wanted to announce that we're opening to questions. So if there are any questions that people have, um, put them in the comments and we will we'll pick as we go. Wanjiro, what did you say? Um, I want to address points both Sam's made. Uh, Sam, yeah. um, it's, and also, if you're asked to do interviews, also volunteer one of your crew members or your cast members, because a lot of times people always want to talk to the director. I sometimes will be like, you know what? It's better if you talk to the DP or if you talk to the editor. Always bounce it off. And that creates also a feeling of community and a further down appreciation, you know, because everybody, you know, you know, a lot of people forget, like people in post, you know, they don't talk about stuff and they're just like, oh, you want to interview me. So always find ways also to be like, I can chat on this, but you know what? Also talk to my DP, talk to my production designer, talk to my editor, you know, bounce it off. And that also not only gives a new voice to the way that the, the project is being is being is being um, shared and, and marketed, but also just a way to keep that 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 family, you know, the film family. And then other Sam said something that I wanted to piggyback on. A lot of festivals, if you attend them in person, there are also other programmers or people from other festivals. Follow up. If a festival uh, programmer from a different festival comes, gives you your card. Um, it's funny because I met the pro I met. Um, a friend who had gone to a festival in North Carolina called Kukaloris. I didn't even know anything about it. I was like, oh, cool name. I submitted. It's still one of my top festival experiences. And I've been to all the big festivals. They fly out all the filmmakers. They put you up. It's filmmaker hosted. Let me tell you, give filmmakers free continental breakfast. You have us for life. I'm telling you. But it was such a film community as they had these happy hours, filmmakers talk. Everybody, we would run to each other's screenings because... You know, nobody's running that, you know, so-and-so actor is at this screening, so-and-so. It was all filmmakers. So we were all, like, we would get up with hangovers and just run to each other's 10 a.m. screenings because somebody came to your 10 p.m. screening the night before and you had a good conversation, you know, you broke bread. So, so go to other filmmakers. If you see a face and if somebody says, hey, my film is showing, try and make the effort because, again, you're building that community. But if a programmer or somebody who's affiliated to a festival sends you an email, be like, hey, we met at this festival, and if you do a nice enough note, I guarantee you, you'll be invited to submit and they'll give you a waiver. And, and most likely, 90% of the time, they program your film. So uh, what I'm hearing is that it's about, it's about relationships, not just with uh, people who could potentially give you distribution opportunities. It's also, it's also top down, you know? So sharing the wealth, as it were, and yeah. opportunities. So that when you do, should you then need to rush to to your actor and say, "Listen, could you um, do this interview?" It's not you're not putting anyone out of joint yeah. for making that request and building relationships so that we have a greater idea of how it is that we manage relationships, create the content that um, that we want to have a life, but also the community in which we make those films. True. Um, I want to ruffle feathers slightly and also speak about being a bit tough. Um, Samora probably knows where I'm heading to, contracts. Um, I, I, I think there's something to be said for having a document that defines what you're supposed to deliver in the course of a production. Um, and I feel like maybe because shots, a lot of shots, especially the ones done on a regional basis are done on a Paliwali basis. So everyone's like, yeah, we're all friends, we're all friends, yeah. And, and we've seen it over and over again. There's always some funny fallout going on on social media because one person didn't acknowledge, one person didn't do this, you know. Mm. I, think, I think contracts are just a safe haven for just giving a guarantee in a contract you can oblige an actor to um, come back for marketing purposes, right? 
And if you're the actor at that point in time, you can say, hey, if you want me to come back six years from now, maybe pay me X and X fee, like what you would want and how you'd want to be treated also. I think people run away from contracts because they are scared of the formality of it, but the formality of it is the security. I, it's what saves you. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so there's a question, 410. How has the networking been, been touring your film in this COVID time? Also keen to hear from anyone else who is traveling, who is traveling films or attending festivals at the moment. So... Um, I haven't traveled uh, during COVID. A lot of festivals have gone virtual. Um, there is a festival box is playing next week in New York, which is playing as a, it's a drive-in cinema. So I'm very excited for that. But a lot of festivals have gone online. But in, in the difference is, is I actually am participating more because it, it had gotten to a point which was a good problem to have. Like my DP and I were dividing and conquering. We'd have festivals on the same day. So he'd go to one, I'd go to another one. But it enables me to not only participate more online, it, it, um, it helps me get to know other filmmakers because all of us are available and we still keep in touch after and the Q&A panels go further. But right now in the US, um, there are they're no physical festivals, everything, all, they've all become virtual. Um, and a couple are doing drive-in drive -in theaters like the one that's happening next week in New York. Okay, so then but my question then is, what is it, would you say, that the mileage that you're getting from doing virtual um, festival attending is greater than if it was um, a physical um, one? Yeah, I feel that um, it, it's reaching more people because everybody's home. And, be, and, you know, as I said, you don't have to dress up, you don't have to go buy a ticket. You don't, I mean, some festivals still have that, but, you know, it's at a click in the same way that you click on Netflix, you click on HBO. So the convenience has actually opened me up to a, a wider festival audience. Um, there was a festival we played in April and they actually tripled the number of attendees and had to extend the festival by 48 hours because they, they did the festival and then the second day they had the, all the filmmaker panels and based on people hearing us speak, they, they told other people and people like, oh, please keep the thumbs up, please keep the thumbs up. So the festival actually was able to extend to 48 hours, which you'd not be able to do with a physical location. You know, you buy in, you're locked in in prices. So I, I honestly feel I just, I'm having a bigger audience because it's it's letting me make time to talk at length about the film. It's making me, it's making it easier for me to attend, you know, because we're all still under stay home orders and productions are slowly picking up. So it's, it's a case of, hey, I don't have to be on set or I'm, I'm traveling somewhere else, so I can't do this panel or I have to catch a flight back, so I have to miss if they put a second round of panels, which happened with another festival, they're just like, oh, guys, people want to see the films again, you know? And a couple of festivals have actually played box again due to audience requests. So, so, but it just, it, it's, it's more accessibility and it's a, it's a variety of audiences. People can tune in from anywhere in the world. What, what are you doing for marketing and lobbying just to sort of get your name out there? Um, I still just use Instagram, you know, uh, Twitter. I'm, I'm pretty tech savvy. So, that, you know, I always try to make sure I do, you know, Wish Wednesday or, you know, whichever hashtag is trending. There's certain, like on Twitter, they still make a Friday. Um, there's Giving Tuesday if you're crowdfunding for your film. So I tell people, honestly, Twitter is such a film resource. There's the hashtag film Twitter, which a lot of filmmakers and, and industry people follow. So just, just sit and just look up, you know, which are the trending hashtags. Um, Every week I share something about the film, even if it's, I've, I've been fortunate enough that I actually am able to share something weekly, festival-wise, or I share a throwback, or I share, you know, I have enough content that I'm able to put something new, or, or I post a tidbit, or just be like, hey, did you guys read this article? Even if the article was six months ago, you know, you can come back and be like, you know, throwback Thursday if you didn't get a chance to read this. So it's just about like every, I always say at least 10 to 15 minutes a week, I do something for the film. You know, it's a post on Facebook, it's a post on Twitter, Instagram, or even... On that I find interesting. Yeah. So actually scheduling time to push yourself or your project on socials. Yeah. And you mentioned a whole bunch of hashtags that I think would be worth putting down yeah. in our descriptions and stuff. Make a Friday. Um, you know, uh, there's one that's have been going on for the last few months is support black creatives. So if you're pushing something, hashtag support black creatives, 
and that puts it in a pool of like 10,000, you know, eyeballs that are looking at it. And, you're able, and the beauty is like on Twitter, right now you can take a look, you can, you can tap and see how a tweet is doing and just the activity. One thing I'm very aware of is also the time because I used to do this at Universal. If I have something to post that I want the Kenya audience to see, I won't post, I'll post it either at the time when I know people are, uh, you know, in bed scrolling or they just woke up. So there are certain windows also where, and, and there's a website I can send and, and you can pin it to the comment section where you can look at by region when people are most active online. So, you know, they suggest don't, don't post something at like 10 a.m. because people have just got into the office, they're scrambling. Post at like 12, 17 because people are now thinking of lunch, they're bored, they're, <laughs> you know, so you have to look at those windows as well when you know there are going to be more people looking at stuff. And that's that. Those are the optimum windows for, for, for sharing on social media. Okay, we have another question from Tom. Um, oh, can you hang on. The sorry, Howard. Yes. It's okay if I, I just want to ask uh, Wanjiro, like, which is okay. So, two, just just two brief questions. The one the one is that yeah. when do you yeah. when do you know? Oh, just one. 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 Okay. Well, and then so this question. Okay. <laughs> okay. So when do you know that the film, the like, when do you need, when do you need to stop promoting a film? Like, when do you know now it's done? Honestly, all my films are like my baby, so I never do. I, I genuinely care about my films. So, like, I did a film years ago, and now she's blown up. Simone Messick is on All Rise CBSs. Once in a while, I post a throwback, and she'll share. You know, and she is very good at, at still amplifying my voice because we became friends outside that before she did, you know, Luke Cage, Altered Carbon. I mean, she's the face of CBS now, but she still remembers how we worked together and the feeling and why I made that film and what I told her as an actress, what she did for me on that film. So I'll, I'll sometimes post a throwback and then she shares it and suddenly I have 50,000 new eyeballs. So you never really stop. You reduce. Like now I'm reducing on box because I'm now about to start. Oh, and one last secret. Uh, Hootsuite, just before you start promoting a film, I always, if I have the money, then I'll pay for it. If I don't, I, I, I do a free trial. Y'all have so many email addresses for Hootsuite, but we won't talk about it. <laughs> but if you have Hootsuite, you can actual, pro, actually program your tweets. So even if I'm asleep and I need a tweet to hit the time of Kenya, you program it, you put it in, it, it posts for you. So you can, and it, you can post across platforms and everything. So when you're just launching a film, I tell people, get a free Hootsuite trial, program it, make hash, and, and people space between your hashtags. I see people posting hashtags, but they're all in one cent. You have to put a space between the hashtag symbol, otherwise the hashtag will not, will not um, uh, populate because it won't, it won't provide the link. So that's actually something I have to tell people a lot of times, like the space between the hashtags so or the hashtag populates, but um, yeah. I, I never, I just, I just reduce, but I always still do something for any of my projects. But again, that's my personality, but it keeps my audience coming in and my friends support. Right. Okay. Yes. Question, so, question from Tom. Uh, considering the disruptions in the world this year, what resulting opportunities do you expect in the near future? Example, Universal and AMC have agreed to do a 14-day theatrical limit before streaming. So people are expecting much lower budget productions to start like the 90s. Um, I, I, won't go, I, I won't go too much into it because I also try not to um, speak too much because I'm not, I'm, I'm not inside the system anymore. But mm -hmm. uh, I, think it, uh, I think COVID will allow for more diverse and creative voices because you can't do the $200 million if executives went and said, look, we can't make 250 million to 400 million dollar films. But, you know, like an example I always give people is Bloomhouse. You know, Bloomhouse have a set budget for all their films. They're like, cast whoever you want, give back end points how you can distribute them, but the budgets are set. And the one beauty about Bloomhouse is they don't start a project saying, this is VOD, this is film, this is, they make the entire project, then they look at it, they test it, then they're like, oh, we tested better. On this it tested better so they never fight where a film is going to end up you know if it's going to end up on hulu if it's going to end up on theatrical so i think if the studios open themselves up i think there's a time to come in with much more creative content because you know it's going to take a while even for people to recover financially so i'm going to be even more picky when i go to the movies you know i'm just like god bless you but the 18 dollars a pop a movie i'm still going to go to the five dollar theater and see two films 
you know, and so make them really good. So I think it's going to start uh, bringing back the creativity in terms of the stories, I hope, in the stories that are told. Nice. I hope you're right, man. I think we need to, sh- we need to, like, we need to disrupt the system a little bit. I think we're due. Yeah. Yeah. So Quatilo is asking, <coughs> when Jiro, do you post on your own personal page about your film or on accounts made for the films? Um, I have individual Instagrams for my films because I do believe, um, I, I don't look at myself as a brand, but I do believe in keeping my individuality because I also do a lot of photography and stuff. So I post um, specific images, but I always guide people to the pages. And that's, again, that's how you build the audience is that, you know, each project and that way I can archive on Instagram, but it will always be there instead of people constantly hunting uh, through. But what I do in my bio is I put director of and the handle of each project. And so when people tap that, they can find it. But I do create um, specific social medias for all my projects. Okay, great. Yes, Denise. Denise was, it was really close, Samara, but Denise got there first. <laughs> <laughs> yes. My, my, my question is actually for Samora. Ooh, awesome. My question is actually for Samora. Um, where do you post most of your content and where do you feel like you get returns of it for what you create? Mostly, I, I have a, of course, I have a page for my platform. <laughs> But mostly I rely a lot on my team to make sure that they are on the, on this, on the project with me. And I rely mm-hmm. a lot on them because I realized that even if I post on my personal pages or on the, um, the pages created for the platform, the actors especially get more feedback than I do. Because they are the faces, they are because they, they are the ones who have branded, so to speak. Yeah. So when 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 an actor shares that, it's uh, I get more returns and you see more um, more reactions and more engagement on, on their posts. So most of the time, I am always banking on the actors. Although, of course, I'll share on my on, on my pages as well everything that the uh, I'm I'm sharing with the actors to share. I'll also post them. And I'll make sure that I post them first on the on the page and, and, and encourage the actors to to share from the page, but also to even share from their own accounts, because I get a lot of engagement from the actors than from even from me. Because again, that's the thing, and I think that's another culture about uh, that is very specific to, especially in Kenya, because maybe because that's the experience and I, I have that our audience. Um, the producers and directors in Kenya, uh, they are not very well known as, as compared to actors. So I, I, and it's something I think I'd encourage, uh, because it's not like if, if, if uh, Tarantino made a film, I wouldn't care who was the main actor. It's Tarantino, I'm going to watch the film, you know. But in Kenya, uh, even the film, even as a filmmaker, even as a filmmaker, I know other filmmakers, but when I know that so and so has made a film, I'll ask, and who's in the film? What's the film about? Then I'll go to watch the film. <laughs> so in Kenya, mostly we sell through the actors and the content of the film more than who is making the film. And which is, uh, goes back to what I said earlier about building this relationship with the actors. Because if you, have, if you don't build a very close relationship and make your actors care about your project, you'll work almost five times as harder if you made uh, your actors care about the project and own it enough to want to even share before you tell them. It's, it, it doesn't need to be in the con- Okay, it's good when it's in the contract, but even if it wasn't in the contract, they'd still want to share. That makes your work a lot easier, uh, especially in the, Kenya, in the Kenyan landscape. Right. Okay. Sam? Yeah. You to, wait, some more, yeah, Samora, you wanted to say something. Then the other side. Okay. I, I wanted to say uh, what they want to say. Uh, give me a second. Give me a second. <laughs> I'll hop in. Oh, uh, <laughs> yes. I wanted to talk about uh, the question that I think it was Nguatilo asked about what the opportunities that have been brought about by COVID. Yeah. And th- this, this should be obvious by now to everyone. Uh, and is, even as uh, through this discussion, as uh, what you have been saying, uh, a lot of um, festival, very many festivals are going online. And very many people are going to watch content online. So even going into the into the future, as uh, Tom Vanders was asking, I think a lot of content is going to be uh, consumed online. So which means every filmmaker, by default, 
will need to pay more attention to Akina Denise. So what, uh, I understand how VOD, uh, VODs work and what they, and prepare for that because I know very many filmmakers get a very, a very excited about film festivals and traveling and all that because we feel that it's, that's how we pay ourselves. Now we can go and have fun and go to Cannes and go to, ah. But now um, very many eyeballs are going online and I can, uh, I can use my, my own example. Bef before COVID, we used to get about maybe, um, our average was about 1.2 million views on our platform, that's our, our YouTube channel. But then uh, during COVID and um, up to last month, our viewership increased to 1.6 to up to, the, I think this a month we had up to 1.9 million views in a month. You know, because people are at home, they are watching more and we got, and, and our viewer, even our subscri subscribers, the, the, the rate of subscription increased rapidly that uh, just during the COVID period, we've gotten almost 30,000 new subscribers on our YouTube channel, mostly because people are home, people are watching more. And even me, as a, because I love watching short films, I know that during this period, I have watched more short films than probably the last two years combined because I was home, I was idle. So any new platform, I wanted to, to check it out. Oh, well, what, what's Netflix offering? What's Showmax, what does Showmax have? So because I had the time, and then we didn't have the luxury of going to waiting for the next um, uh, big movie to be released on, on, on cinemas. Yeah, so let's pay more attention to the online space and especially think of how content is consumed on smaller screens because uh, very many eyeballs are moving from billboards to, to our phones. So think of that even as you make, you're making your film, understand that. And there's something that uh, Wanjiru mentioned about shots being too long. Understand that this is someone who, this is someone who um, is stuck in traffic for a few minutes, or I have a window. My boss is not around, so I can I can go watch something real quick on on this platform. Oh, so make the... your shots as short as possible, yeah. really, because the shorter it is, the more powerful it will be. Most of the time, that's the case. Because if you if you go wrong with a short film, if you make a short a short film long too long, then it's it's painful. It's it's you shouldn't do that to another human being. So. <laughs> Let's learn to make sh uh, shorter films, shorter form content, because not just because, um, because I know we are used to making uh, the regular feature length because of pro uh, scheduling and programming. But then again, if you think of, uh, especially for us and uh, some and the other some who are in uh, self distribution mode, yeah. think of how you can maximize on the eyeballs, get people to watch your short film and want more. And people wouldn't want more when you give them a three hour movie. If someone wants to go and do whatever they want to do. But if you give them a short form, they want to come back to your platform. And that uh, traffic is what, what's going to pay most of us in the, in, in the future. I, I, that's what I think. Okay. So, Wanjiro, I do want to, I, this is the moment for your, for your gripe. <laughs> um, and then we have a question for the other Sam. So. Um. I mean, I mean, for me, I've always had, I, I've never been a fan of long shots, you know, I feel- What like is a long short? A long shot, <laughs> I, I think you start going in the 15, 20 minutes plus um, space. I already got, you know, because I, like, like as Denise said, if I have to program five, five films, I have a half an hour block and I get five really great, you know, five minute shots and one good, and, and I say good, 15 minute film, you know, I'll just, it, it, it will swing to the five because as, 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 as Sam said, there's something about sitting and watching tight, concise shots that, they, that you know, you're going from credits to the next shot to the next shot. But it's also a thing of, it challenges you as a filmmaker to make a tight, concise film. Like there are two short films to this day, my absolute favorite as a filmmaker. I watched a short film made by a Palestinian. I think it's on YouTube. It's called A Boy, A Donkey and a Wall. It's about uh, the Palestinian-Israeli wall, but it was so well done and it was so tight and concise. To this day, that shot rings in the back of my head. You know, I tell people, think about how Pixar has their, their small shot before a film. I'm always running, almost falling. I leave, like if I get to the theater late, I don't buy my popcorn, I watch the shot, then I come back out to get my popcorn. It's, it's, it's one of those, like when they're tight, they're concise, they're so memorable. And they are so, and they make it so much easier for, for a programmer because I never want to be in the place where I'm like, there's this 15 minute, but if I do this 15 minute, I lose four other filmmakers, you know? And so that's the point that you also put programmers and distributors in a dilemma. And think about this, like being a good filmmaker is also knowing when to cut. It's like dead weight, when to cut and when to, you can still tell a concise story within a specific place. There are 
they'll just sit and think of how can I make this tighter? How can I make this, you know, how can I have my actor doing something while they say dialogue instead of moving from one space to another, but very concise, like think of the Marjan scene in Crazy Rich Asians, you know, they're playing the Marjan game, but there's so much said between what they're saying and what they're doing that is so cinematic that if they just had that scene as a standalone trailer, I would have gone to see that movie, you know? So, so just think about it, like don't torment your audience, you know, it's, there's a really weird black hole that space that short films go after 15 minutes. And even with the best filmmakers, there's just a weird space that it just falls into in that time. So there's a question for Sam about Kiasi TV. Talk a little bit about yes. that and the journey of becoming a VOD platform owner in general or even in this COVID time. And I need to say, actually, guys, we have about five or so minutes. We can go an extra five minutes more if you guys are okay with that. But then, really, we're wrapping it up, yeah? So any other questions? Okay. I think we've got room for about two more. Yeah. Okay, so Kiasi TV is a short-form content platform. And um, the idea is to curate Afrocentric content filmmakers of African descent, basically. So it doesn't matter whether you're on the African continent, if you're in the diaspora, as long as you have a connection with Africa, that's what we're looking for. And the idea being that we don't have many spaces where our content is cons not just consumed, but just exhibited. So I wanted to be, I wanted to be one of the, the few and the growing number that are providing this space. And so for me, I actually, the, the idea of, to set up a v VOD platform came to me in 2016. And at the time, it cost a lot of money to do and a lot of programming and all that stuff. So fast forward a couple of years later and the current platform we're, we're on makes it possible for us to run without spending quite, without actually spending any money. So whenever people pay, that's when they deduct that money for their platform. So it's possible for me to, or for us to be able to have this platform and showcase the work at almost no cost to us. Yeah, so th for us, that's that's kind of where we where we sit, and hopefully, over as we grow, we'll get an app or two or ten, yeah, and share it with the world. That's kind of where we're we're going. And then, um, has COVID played a role at all? I wouldn't say COVID has, because for me, to like the idea to set up the platform was be before COVID, really. And I, I we looked at an opportunity, and, and I don't know who mentioned it earlier. Like you have a moment, you're at the doctor's office or you're in the line at the supermarket or you're in the matatu. There are those moments, those in-between moments, or even just before you go to bed. You don't want to watch a movie. You don't want to watch a TV series of 30 minutes. You want to watch five minutes, 10 minutes, max, three minutes, slot in that short film or that little thing or that lifestyle show. You know, we feel that we can fit in that pocket. And I know it almost sounds like Quibi because I kind of also realized that Quibi... Um, from Jeff Katzenberg, formerly of, of DreamWorks. He set up a platform with that very idea in mind. So I thought, why not set up something for us as you know, African filmmakers? There right. are those wonderful opportunities right there. And yeah. I see it going beyond COVID. COVID just accelerated mm -hmm. our shift the world over towards the digital space. So there is a, yeah. a natural opportunity to develop audiences for the work we're doing and we should embrace that opportunity as filmmakers in East Africa, Africa, around the world. Okay, there's one last question. Someone was asking, and this is open to the floor. Um, it's, it's asking, um, have you guys thought of using Pinterest to promote your films? I mean, I Interesting. A few films hmm. wow. have cinematography. You know, like stills I love from my DPs and stuff, but Pinterest is a little harder to navigate because Pinterest is more for inspiration. Um, and yes. I don't think that there's a very large, like I know when I go to Pinterest, I'm not going to look for a film. I'm like, oh, I want to find a, a, a still that can communicate what, what I want my DP to do and that type. So so it is a bit, it's it's more to share. It's it's more like a portfolio, but it's not, it's oh, not a good marketing tool. On, oh, that's just Personally? Mm -hmm. I'd rather go Snapchat and TikTok than Pinterest. 
Yeah. Because yeah, the the teenagers and the we who are our next audience, um, uh, our young adults are more on Snapchat and TikTok. So I'd rather I'd rather think of something I can do around TikTok, uh, because I don't know many people who use Pinterest. I don't use Pinterest even I as a as a consumer. I don't use. So I don't even know. I, I once in a while when I need a photo of something, I'll go and grab one from from Pin Pinterest to make my mood boards and stuff. But not to promote or market my stuff. So, and actually, as a, I mean, actually, we should put a note on that. TikTok is a very good place to market your stuff. Yeah, right. although not in the US, because in about a couple of days they won't be. <laughs> they may not be uh, in the US. I, I have a TikTok account, so I think I'm just. I'm just. I, I don't know if I'm on Z or just the old, You know, <laughs> it's a lot of work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys, listen, this Can has I been an something? amazing conversation. It's been a wonderful conversation. Last words, last words, and then we're going to say goodbye and thanks and all of that. Samara. Okay, my last words. <laughs> I, I thought of this when uh, Sam was speaking about, uh, again, I, I go back to relationships. You as a filmmaker, do you have a relationship with your audience? build a relationship with your audience, build an email list, build a contact list. Don't wait for Denise and Showmax and the platforms to market your stuff. Build your own uh, list and do your own marketing. So even if your, your shot or your film is hosted on Showmax or on Netflix, it really helps, or on Kiasi TV, it really helps as a filmmaker if you can broadcast that to your, to, to your 10,000 uh, people on, on, on your contact list that, oh, my, short, my new short film is on KRC TV. You make his work a lot easier. And then if you already have an, uh, an audience that already knows your work and appreciates your work, to drive that fast traffic to, to, his, to KRC TV, to that platform, then it makes the, even the platform realize, oh, there's an audience here. The people are interested in this. Then it becomes easier even for YouTube. That's how, um, I, I talk a lot about YouTube because that's what I'm very conversant with. But if you have a lot of traffic coming in from the first day your, your, your short is posted, then it becomes easy for, for that organic expansion to, to happen and then more people will discover your short film or even the platform will give will set aside more uh, time and funds to market your short film on their platform. So don't wait on, on just the platform to, to market your, your stuff. And I, I want to give a reference to something that really changed my understanding of um, uh, prep and uh, marketing from uh, what Peter Jackson did for Lord of the Rings way back when vlogging was not a thing back then. But for those who know, and you can go and check this on YouTube, like he started vlog <laughs> vlogging we'll about... It we'll, put it, we'll, put it in the, we'll put it in the resources later. Yeah? Right. So, Mara? Yes, yes. Thanks. Mm. Uh -huh. Keep going. Yeah, We're so he started... He's, then I have he started... one last thing to address, but yes, go on. Okay. okay. Yeah, so he, he started vlogging about Lord of the Rings way from the time they were building sets when they're visiting locations, and he will talk to the... the I mean, he was vlogging himself. Uh, talking to to the people and he's the director he's the producer of the film but he created time he set aside time to talk about his project and and have someone to do all, all the coverage for when they were building sets and they were visiting locations and when they were casting people and interviewing people and um it really teaches you uh, how he prepared for the marketing way even and especially by the fact that he they already seen even part three that was going to be released, I don't know, maybe probably like six years later, but he prepared for that way before even the first uh, day of shooting for, for the part one of the movie happened. So prepare for distribution because uh, that's, that will make, make or break you as a filmmaker. If you, if you can't hack uh, distribution uh, and you don't have um, a rich uncle or aunt to keep funding you for your films, you'll, you, you won't make any more short films and show the world your awesomeness. So make movies with the end game in mind awesome thank you very much for those very beautiful last words guys thank you so much this has been a wonderful conversation i could keep going but um we're short for a reason concise yes yes <laughs> um there was um uh, ak simba was asking about um the significance of production design and art department in relation to African storytelling. That is a whole other subject that we are actually looking at for another talk when we do one. So it's on the list of things to talk about. In the meantime, guys, yes, Wanjiro, you want to talk? One give in that area, Yvonne Mwindi, who is an amazing mat artist designer and worked with Peter Jackson, is now based yeah. in Kenya. 
Um, yes, yeah. I know she is. I, I know she is. She is super. Oh. Yeah, I met her. Yes, 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 yes. So yes. that question. But yes. Very no, we started to have conversations. No, no, no. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. So <laughs> conversation is, is in the works. There are other conversations that we that we have to talk about because there's so many aspects that we need to get into. Yes, Wanjiro. <laughs> I also have to ask, this is the most important thing at the end of a short panel, is to ask the filmmakers to plug, where can we see your work? Because that's how yes. we build our audience. Yes, yes. Okay, so, God, I'm terrible. But yes, so where can we see your work? And can we have links to share so that we can put them at the bottom in our resource page so people can have a look? Yes? Yes. Nod? Yes. Yes? yes? yes. Wonderful. Everyone, thank you very, very much. It has been wonderful. Have a good evening and thank you so much for joining us on Manyata Talks. Have a good evening. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. And you have been awesome as well. Yes, good. thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Howard. Thank you. It's been fantastic. You guys, you've been brilliant. Bye. 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 See you. Thank you.